Hey, it's Jim, and this is level one of the CFA program, the topic on alternative investments and the learning module on natural resources. I bet you recall that in a previous learning module, I gave you the imagery of dirt when we were talking about real estate and infrastructure investments. Well, I'm going to use that same imagery here, but back in real estate and infrastructure, we were mostly concerned about the structures that you could build on top of the dirt, like an apartment building or a bridge. Here, we're going to be focused on what goes under the dirt or what comes out of the dirt naturally. How about that? You know, so what's under the dirt, a gold mine, an oil well, what grows out of the dirt, uh, a stalk of corn, maybe a honey crisp apple tree. But our focus back in real estate and infrastructure is going to be the same focus that we have here. On the risk side, we're going to focus on correlation coefficients and diversification. On the compensation side, we're going to focus on income and capital gains. Now, as you look at these learning outcome statements, I want you to focus during this slide deck on definitions. The nine questions at the end of this learning module all sound like, which of the following is most accurate? Which of the following is least accurate? So it's all definitional, but there's a focus on some of the similar things that we talked about in all of these alternative investment learning modules. But there are some extra unique characteristics about uh, farmland and the timber and the raw land. Raw land, this is an interesting concept. You know, this is really the dirt that I was talking about uh, just a moment ago and in that, previous, uh, in that previous learning module. This is dirt that doesn't really have a use, but it has a potential use. So lots of times people invest in just some land over there because the, they figure that sooner or later the town or the city or the borough is going to expand out to that land and someone's going to want to buy it. Now, it might not be for five years or 10 years. Maybe it won't be for 100 years. Uh, but then the other part of that raw land uh, feature is that you could kind of turn it into something if you want to. All right, let's go ahead and get down to some good definitions here. So natural resources. You probably should know the terms soft commodities and hard commodities. You should probably know the difference between energy and plants and metals and industrial goods. I mean, these are just obvious notions here. So let's talk specifically about that first LOS. All right, so what do we do? We ha we've got the timber, right? So it's a factory and a warehouse, which means that what we can do is that we can plant the trees, we can harvest the trees, and then hopefully right next door, we have some kind of a place where we can uh, convert them into two by fours or two by sixes or a piano or whatever else that needs to be. So there's a warehouse. So think about this. Not only do we have to invest in the land, not only do we have to invest in the trees, but we also need to invest in factories and warehouses as well so that we can harvest. And one of the interesting things about uh, timberland is that the, you know, I mean, you think about it. Uh, I always think of timberland up in Canada, right? How long does it take to get to Canada? Well, you know, it's a long way. So how do you get the two by fours from way up there down to, let's say, Texas, where you might want to build a house on, on a lake? You know, so transportation is a huge issue with that timberland. So think about, you know, extra unique variables that layer that layer this learning module with all of our other alternative investment learning modules. Uh, farmland, we can grow the crops and we can have cows and pigs and uh, chickens and alligators uh, that, uh, that roam the land. One of the fascinating things that I've read about over the last couple of years, and I've mentioned this in a previous learning module, is that there are some farmers in the Midwest who uh, they pay somebody, maybe it's their children, to go out with shovels and they collect all of the presents that the cows leave out in the pasture and they put it into under the ground and they compress it and they probably put some uh, chemicals on it and then the methane gas comes up and they have the, they capture the gas and then it air conditions and heats and provides electricity so that's really really a cool thing so remember that we're not abandoning the roots of our conversation in positive net present value projects being able to capture the natural what did I call it earlier? The natural presence from the cows mm -hmm. and the pigs and to turn it into a positive net present value project is some unique aspect of, uh, of farmland. 
and then raw land, undeveloped land that has not been improved, right? It's not been developed for any specific purpose. You may buy that because you have a specific purpose, but then of course you may buy it because somebody sooner or later, maybe Sam Walton is gonna come along and say, you know what? I want your land to build a Walmart. Now the Institute is very big on asking questions that sound like, what are these things uh, look alike and what do these things look differently? So let's talk about similarities and differences between what we're talking about here and what we mentioned in that previous, um, in that previous learning module. So similarities, these are true for lots and lots of alternative investments. Illiquid, right, unique. Uh, they have distinct geographic location and features. You know, where I grew up, I, I was so lucky. I grew up near a farm and we had hills and valleys and caves and mountains. And so there was all sorts of stuff. And on the side of the hill, you know, there were rocks. And so there was no way you could plant corn in there. And, uh, and the farmer had somebody out to dig into there and say, you know, is there a gold mine there? Well, no, there was nothing there. So this is kind of, uh, you know, distinct geographic location that may or may not uh, may or may not have any use. But the cool thing about all of this alternative investment here is that it can provide a steady cash flow stream, price appreciation and return. Uh, the difference is then is that we need to worry about the stuff that's under the dirt and the quality of the dirt. Uh, I read a book years and years ago by one of my favorite authors in, in which uh, the, this bad guy was growing uh, tobacco in North Carolina and he was using the money for something I can't remember, but he was, he was just a bad guy and we were rooting against him. And he didn't rotate his crops. So he planted the same kind of uh, tobacco every year, year after year, and then uh, he, it's sooner or later it just diminished in quality and so he couldn't he couldn't sell it so quality of soil you know what's the weather look like does it rain every day uh, is there too much sun uh, what does the geology look like so think about the reliance here i've said this to you regularly the the institute they don't require us to be accountants they don't require us to be uh, estate lawyers they clearly are not going to require us to be geologists or climate scientists or scientists of any nature to go out and look at the dirt and say, hey, this is good dirt. So we have to hire a third party to come in and say, you know what? Uh, this is a total waste of time. There's nothing good on this piece of land. And you may say, I'll buy it anyway, just because Sam Walton may come along. All right, so location is crucial. There's what I was talking about earlier, transport expenses. You need specialized knowledge to understand the natural resource. There's that reliance on third party. But of course, you can imagine that the financial services industry has uh, engineered kind of this new animal out there, these TMOs, Timberland Investment Management Organization, in which they get some smart people together and say, okay, we're gonna go out and look at that property and that property and that property, and we're gonna test the soil, we're gonna do all this kind of great stuff and then we're going to turn this into kind of like a uh, kind of like uh, a private equity fund or maybe a mutual fund i mean you can do all any sorts of thing to use somebody else's resources but instead of going out and finding your own third party these kind of have the, their own built-in their own built-in uh, management ways to make it easier for people like you and me to make that investment yeah, look down at the bottom here. We talk about this all the time. Bank loans, uh, private debt, uh, restricted pool of potential buyers. Look at the bottom, significant capital required. So those, those make perfect sense here. How about some features? Uh, why do we like farmland and timberland? Yeah, cushion against financial market fluctuations. What, what do we know? We know that if we lived on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, sometimes we're way up, sometimes we're way down, sometimes we're in the middle, sometimes we have no idea if we're on the upslope or the downslope. So there's, uh, you know, a buffer or a cushion. Regular income from uh, sales of the lumber regular income from sales of the crops. I'm always fascinated uh, in November and December, you know, there are lots of farms in our area that advertise, hey, come and, uh, you know, chop down a tree and uh, you can put it your, in, in your house to celebrate the holidays. And uh, we've done this for a hundred years. And so, uh, you know, I always go and think, okay, where are all the new trees that are being planted? Well, somewhere they're being planted, I guess. Inflation protection, 
Uh, we talked about that in the previous learning module. What does that mean? That if there's regular regular inflation, that typically means that rents uh, that rents go up, and this is certainly true after COVID. Uh, market cycles in farming and timberland look like this. Can you guys see my hands? You know, I'm going up and down up a little bit, as opposed to as opposed to you know something that uh, something that goes quickly. So the peaks and the valleys are much more spaced out here in this uh, in this alternative investment. Yeah. So what are the revenue drivers? Of course, we want to we want to plant uh, we want to plant honey crisp apple trees for five dollars and then sell a million honey crisp apples and generate a billion dollars in revenue. So still, we want to buy low and sell high. We want to make something for pennies and sell it for dollars. Now, that's uh, very different than making sneakers for for Nike because you do the planting and then, boy, it might be five years uh, until you get your first honey crisp apple. So you got to fi fix that into the whole capital budgeting uh, process. And then, of course, price appreciation. You know, what do we know? Land tends to appreciate in value over time. Now, it's a generally a low rate, 2%, maybe 3% over time. But, but you know, what you're looking for is, you, you know, 2%, 3%, 2%, 1%. And then all of a sudden, Sam Walton shows up and says, I give you a million dollars for uh, that little tiny piece of land over there. Price appreciation. Now, like many alternative investments, we can do this directly by just going out and buying the land ourselves, uh, We can do it indirectly. Uh, we can use these separately managed accounts. Uh, some of these look an awful lot like, uh, like private equity funds. You know, you could call these private farming funds. You know, they're all different sorts of names that are out there. Um, so remember, difference between direct and indirect. Some of these challenges, of course, you're not going to be surprised to hear about illiquidity. It's very difficult to sell a piece of land in a short time period. So coupled with that illiquidity is the specter of making certain that we can value it properly. Price transparency leads right into it there and, and, and then the risk. There's a really good uh, there's a really good level two learning module on valuing a business and price transparency is a huge deal. So how are we going to couple, couple, you know, a piece of land with the consistent valuation of a share of stock on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange? So you got to separate those two. We're going to use the same kinds of principles, but the the land has so many unique characteristics that by the end of the story, it may look completely different, even though the fundamentals are pretty much the same. And then some extra risks, of course, with land are unpredictable weather patterns. Now, a couple of environmental and social benefits here. Uh, yeah, farmland and timberland, what do those things do? The Honeycrisp apple tree, what do they do? They, they, they eat the carbon, right? And they give off oxygen. I'm not a scientist, but I do know that that much is true. Um, yeah, you can conserve the land and prevent it from turning into, uh, you know, some kind of a concrete facility. And then all of the ESG considerations, we have separate learning modules about that. I think this is a really good slide. I think what you need to remember for the exam is you've got fixed income securities, you've got equity securities, and then you have alternative investments. So inside of this alternative investments, we have all these different learning modules. So I would be prepared for a question on energy, base and precious metals, agriculture, and maybe, maybe some, some others there. And, you know, what are you looking for here? The, the questions have to do with what's the correlation between, you know, say lead and coffee? I mean, you don't even have to scratch your head. You know, what's that correlation? I don't know. I have no idea what it is, but it's probably close to zero. What's the correlation between lead and the share of Nike stock? Well, that's probably zero, but it might even be negative. So the Institute is very likely to give you a sense of what that correlation is if it wants you to go down that path. But I think you're safe if you just think about these things in terms of low correlation and, and diversification within the context of all of the limitations that we just talked about in that previous slide or two. What's the source of value? This is exactly what we're saying. Source of value is uh, rent, cash flow, sale of the Honeycrisp apples, and then the... Uh, 
uh, capital gain or the price appreciation. Now, there's an extra layer in here in that if we have a Honeycrisp apple farm, so you think about it, we have all these trees, so we go and we, we pick the Honeycrisp apples. You know, let's just suppose we pick 100 of them. And so what do we do? We send, let's say, 20 out to the farmer's market. We send another 30 out to all the local grocery stores, but then we have 50 that we need to store. So we put them in our warehouse. Remember, they have to be air conditioned, they have to be heated, they have to be in the right temperature. We have to pay somebody to stand next to the, uh, to the refrigerator so that nobody comes by and steals them. So we have to worry about transportation, we have to worry about storage, we have to worry about insurance. So you have to layer, you have to layer that cost and we'll see that explicitly here in just a minute. Uh, government role, of course, uh, governments are interested in timber and farming because we consume these things on a regular basis. We can't live without them. So the government comes in and says, you know what, we're going to subsidize certain commodities out there. So look at this, subsidize to maintain consumer friendly food prices, extend price support to farmers. This is a huge political issue in the United States every year, especially during a, uh, a presidential election season. All of the presidential candidates, they go to Iowa and they campaign in Iowa and they say things like, oh my gosh, yes, we're here to help the farmers. And that's an important, that's an important thing. Yeah, look at that second one there, regulate the extraction rights of natural resources. You know, if you find a gold mine in your backyard or you buy a piece of property over there that you think or you know has gold in it, the government's going to come by and say something like, OK, well, you know, if there's 100 troy ounces under there, you know, maybe you do 30 this year, and 60 next year, whatever it is. And then in emerging markets and some developing countries, there are all sorts of extra government roles to kind of promote, uh, to, to promote, you know, the search for the harvesting, the, you know, the smolting and the melting and all those terms that go into uh, turning a commodity into something that's uh, be consumed. Uh, other environmental factors. The government comes in and says, you know, we have these climate objectives. So let's make sure that we're consistent with those, uh, especially with mining. You know, the Institute gives the example of these low carbon energy technologies. But then you have to go and build batteries that need lithium and cobalt and nickel. And so, you know, there's the question of marginal cost, marginal benefit. How do you get this, these minerals out of the ground and can you do it with uh, something that doesn't run on diesel fuel? I mean, that's a huge issue. And so it it's comes down to uh, marginal cost, marginal benefit. Sustainable farming techniques. There's my example of using the cow presence to, uh, to air, conditioning, air condition the barn. All right, how about some more uh, unique characteristics in particular of commodities? A couple of things that are important here is that the Institute gives us an idea that, you know, here in the United States, we've been probably growing commodities for a super long time. They've been growing commodities in other countries, you know, Russia and China and other developed nations for a super long time. But what happens then is the technologies that are developed and passed on to emerging markets. And these emerging technologies are able to make life better for people throughout the world. Now layer that with the simple fact that much, much of the investment in commodities is done through derivative securities. We have futures contracts, we have option contracts, we have uh, swap contracts. And so the really cool thing about this, look down at that very bottom, right? What do we have? Price discovery. So what did I say earlier? It's really difficult to kind of put a price tag on acreage of a Honeycrisp apple farm. But if you have a derivative market out there, all you have to do is go to the Honeycrisp apple futures market, which by the way, it doesn't exist. But you could go to the Honeycrisp apple futures market and you could see, oh, this is what people are willing to pay for, you know, a thousand Honeycrisp apples in a month. Boy, I can use that price discovery to help me value this piece of property. So this is a great lesson for all of us. Remember, we, we, are, we are financial analysts, we are pro-business, we are pro-derivative securities. Mm -hmm. And so when you hear politicians say, oh, those risky derivative securities cause so many problems, 
And the simple fact is that they're misused and abused. But if they are used properly, they have tremendous, tremendous benefits, not just for the consuming society, but for society in general. So remember that price discovery and then look up uh, to the purple diamond point because these markets oftentimes lack price transparency where you get it over in the derivative market. Now, how can you do this? I mentioned this a couple of times. You know, there are the private equity funds that we talked about in an earlier learning module, but there are similar vehicles for uh, commodity alternative investments. Um, you know, there are exchange traded products. There are commodity trading advisors. There are specialized funds. Those specialized funds down at the bottom, those are pretty much like private equity, you know, exchange traded products. These look just like an ETF. And then you can have advisors, right? We can have advisors and this is like kind of like a mutual fund and where you just send them your money and they say something like, oh, we're going to take this and we're going to go invest it on uh, the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Maybe we'll short an orange juice futures contract like Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd did in that great Trading Places mm -hmm. movie. Or maybe we'll take the long position in a honey futures contract if such a thing exists. All right, so how do we figure out what this uh, what this price is? In order for us to have a derivative market, we need to have a spot market. So just think about everything that we talked about back in our microeconomics conversation. What's the spot price of a troy ounce of gold? What's the spot price of a barrel of oil? What's the spot price of an ear of corn? Well, this is just supply and demand. Now, of course, uh, supply and demand for these commodities can be seasonal, it can depend on weather, it can, it can depend on leverage, it can depend on lots and lots of different things. So it's a little bit different than what is the supply and demand for, let's say, an iPhone. But it's still supply and demand. So you have that spot market in which that market clearing price is going to be re revealed to all of us. But then we have a derivative market over here in which we're saying something like, you know what? We don't need the Honeycrisp apple today. I don't need the troy ounce of gold today, but I'm going to need it in a month or I'm going to need it in six months. Or if we take the other side of the transaction, I'm going to need to sell it in 12 months, right? So the price of the derivative security is derived, that should make perfect sense, is derived from the spot price. Now, of course, there has to be a no arbitrage condition. I mean, imagine, imagine if I could take my Honeycrisp apple and I could go sell it on the market today for, let's say, a dollar. But you came to me and said, you know, what, Jim, I don't really need that Honeycrisp apple today, but I need it in a month. I'll pay you a dollar ten in a month. So I have this Honeycrisp apple. I'm going to have to put it in storage, make sure it doesn't uh, get stolen, make sure the worms don't get in it. And so we agree. And in a month's time, you show up, you pay me a dollar ten, I give you this beautiful Honeycrisp apple. Actually, what I'll probably do is just go pick one uh, from my tree, but still, the cost of carrying that has to be embedded in that futures price. Now, suppose what you could do, suppose you could go to the market and buy that Honeycrisp apple from me for a dollar, and then somebody over here, I'll, I'll, I'll say, I'll just look back here. Somebody over here says, oh, I need that Honeycrisp apple. I'll pay you $5 in one month. You're thinking, oh my gosh, this is the greatest thing that ever happened. So what are you going to do? You're going to do that as many times as you can. That's an arbitrage profit. So the relationship between the spot price and the futures price has to have no arbitrage opportunities. Remember how we describe uh, arbitrage, uh, no investment. Uh, no risk, and a positive uh, return. Now, a couple other things that go into the basics of commodity pricing is that um, at some point, at some point, if I'm holding my Honeycrisp apples, maybe, just maybe, and hopefully this doesn't happen, but suppose something happens to all of the other Honeycrisp apple farmers out there. You know, somehow their crop gets wiped out. I'm not wishing for this. I'm just saying somehow this happens. My Honeycrisp apple trees are perfect, right? And mine are still juicy. Oh, you bite into one of these things. It's awesome. Well, what's going to happen to my price? Because of some force out there, some supply shock, I have this convenient yield, right? So I can sell my Honeycrisp apples. I was selling them for a dollar. Now I can sell them for $5. You know, we call that a convenience yield. It's a non-monetary benefit because 
I mean, I, I get the monetary benefit if that bad thing happens to all of my competition, but I can still I can still count on that convenience yield because I know that something is going to happen and I may be able to sell it for a higher price convenience yield. All right. Now, the the uh, the combination of the spot and the uh, and the derivatives market comes into play with this convenience yield because somehow at some point someone might say like like in my example that you know what i don't really want to go trade over in that futures market i'm going to show up on jim's farm and i'm going to just start buying up all of his apples and so i'm taking these apples off the tree and i'm selling them and i'm selling them and i'm selling them i'm thinking wait a minute what if people come to me and say they want to sign a contract for a month or six months or 12 years well the spot market takes precedence over the derivatives market and that's what's so cool about the derivatives market is that even if i have a bunch of positions opened in the derivatives market i can close them uh, without a physical delivery. So think about the combination of those two things with the convenience yield. All right, so let's finish up this, uh, this slide deck by looking at a great pricing equation here. So all we're saying is that the price of a forward contract or a futures contract here, uh, and we're assuming continuous compounding here, there's our little uh, italicized E. Now, all we're gonna do is say that the forward price or the futures price is nothing more than the future value of the spot price. So we take the spot, there's the S sub zero, and we're gonna compound that out by a risk-free rate of interest. And we'll talk at length about why the risk-free rate of interest is relevant, but we won't do that until, uh, until level two. So think about that right now. That's the risk-free rate of interest. We're gonna add a, uh, the cost of carry in there because we have to pay for the insurance and we have to pay for, uh, the air conditioning and all the electricity. And then we're going to subtract out that convenience yield because if you invest in the forward or the futures contract, if you invest in the derivative, you, you, don't, get, uh, you don't get that convenience yield. So just think about the uh, forward price or the futures price as a compounded future value of the spot price. Now, there can be two relationships. The forward price can be above the spot price or it can be below the spot price. Typically, in my earlier example, what did I say? The spot of the Honeycrisp apple was a dollar. The forward or the futures price was a dollar ten. So typically, typically the spot price is below the forward or the futures price because of all of those things that I mentioned, insurance, so we call that uh, we call that contango. That's kind of like the normal way. But if it's reversed, if the spot price is above the forward price, then we have something called normal backwardation or backwardation. And so uh, all you need to do, well, look at the bottom diamond point there. Cost of carry is higher than the convenience yield for contango. And so that might uh, that makes perfect sense. So before before you dip into this derivative market as a potential for investing in commodities, you need to be aware of whether the market is in backwardation or contango. You need to know whether you're paying more or less for the forward or the futures contract, which might impact your decision to go ahead and make that investment. Now, the very last part of this LOS is really just a summary of what I have been saying throughout this uh, throughout this recording here. So, what are the dyna dynamics of supply and demand inf influenced by production? Their seasonality, short-term inventory levels. I mentioned that before. Mm -hmm. On the demand side, you know, how many people really need to eat a Honeycrisp apple today? How many people need to buy a gold uh, band to get married? Well. All of these things uh, are probably cyclical in nature. So remember that on the demand and supply uh, side um, for the pricing in the spot and the pricing in the future as well. Now, if there's a huge, uh, if there's a huge reduction in the supply of honey crisp apples, I'm probably not gonna be able to plant trees and uh, make up for that lack of supply. And so what do we have to do? I mean, here as a, you know, I'm in the US, right? So as a US economy, if we have 
if all of our Honeycrisp apple trees are wiped out, what are we going to have to do? We're going to have to import Honeycrisp apples or we're going to have to substitute, you know, maybe the pink lady apples or maybe the granny apples. But, oh, man, oh, I would never be willing to do that as a lover of Honeycrisp apples. All right. So this is what I was saying over in the right. You know this. Generating returns, diversifying portfolios. There's correlation coefficient embedded in both of those things. And then a shield against inflation. Yeah. All right. So what happens? Uh, sources of return. We've got uh, farmland and timberland. Boy, what did I say earlier about the tobacco example? So what do we know? And I said this to you in multiple uh, recordings is that I was lucky enough to grow up next uh, next to a farm. And our farmer would uh, sometimes he would have the tomato plants here. Sometimes he would have the cantaloupe plants here. Now, you can't really do anything with his peach trees. Oh, my gosh, the peaches, uh, they, they were just so awesome. You would bite into that peach and it would just it would just go all the way down all over your over your chin and down into your shirt and all over your shoes. Boy, eating a peach uh, uh, in the middle of the summer was really an awesome thing. All right. So what happens, though, those peach trees, they get mature and mature. And so so you have, you know, 10 peaches the first year and then 100 peaches and then 1000 peaches, you know, right. So the timberland, this is what I was saying about the, the Christmas trees. You know, there are growth cycles and there are differences in demand. Mm -hmm. What are the problems here? So limited liquidity, right? Negative cash flows early on due to those high fixed costs. That makes sense. Revenues can be based on weather conditions. Um, yeah, farmland and timberland are significantly impacted by global risk. That's probably a really good, uh, really good exam question. Raw land is, is riskier. That's another really great. In fact, I would know that. Uh, I would know that sentence for the exam. Riskier than farmland or timberland because you really don't know what's going to happen. And there's lack of liquidity and Sam Walton may never, may never show up. We talked about this as a hedge against inflation and portfolio diversification. And that takes us through these learning outcome statements. I want you to go to the uh, handful of questions at the end of this learning module. I think there are nine of them. I bet you could work through those in four and a half minutes. Uh, which of the following is most accurate? So we've covered almost everything that's inside of those questions. So, hey, thanks for watching. Have a great day and good luck studying.